city built. It's time for the Steel City Nation podcast. Here's your host, Mark Meriday. All right, my guest today is comedian, game show host, uh, just a man of the ages, Frank Nicotero. Frank is originally a Pittsburgh-based guy who's been in L.A. for, oh, how long now, Frank? 20 years? Uh, yeah, a little even more. I, I guess I, I first started visiting for prolonged periods of time in like 93, 94, 95, but officially October 96, so 24 years almost. Yeah, a long time. God bless you. L.A. for 24 years. That's, that's it's like half. I've, I've pretty much spent half my life in Pittsburgh, half my life in L.A. Because uh, we lived out here in the 70s. He, my dad was a DJ and he was out here trying to do some writing and acting and stuff. So uh, the mid 70s. And then so it's been it's been Pittsburgh till I was five. L.A. five to ten. Uh, Pittsburgh 10 to 26. And now L.A. for the it's literally half my life in each city, pretty much even. You get back to Pittsburgh very often. I, I do. Um, I always come back for some, some pirate games in the summer, uh, try to schedule a show around that, and then uh, try to come back for a Steeler game, too, usually around the holidays. You know, um, yeah. The last time I was there was last August, and uh, I did a show at the uh, Strand Theater in Zillionopole with uh, Sean Black. I'm a mutual friend of ours and yes. comedian friend of mine, David Michael, and we sold that out and had a blast and then went to a, a couple pirate games while I was in town. So I, I always hit PNC when I can. Um, I mean, it's such a beautiful ballpark and it is. Uh, we'll get to the Pirates, I'm sure. But yeah, so I, I try to get back, you know, once or twice a year. Unfortunately, I haven't been back in 2019 or 2020, obviously, um, which sucks because I'd love to be back and see family and friends. And, you know, my mom's still there and, but, you know, can't come back. I don't know. There's not a lot happening back in Pittsburgh right now. But uh, all right. So let's start with this. What sort of sports do you play growing up? Were you, were you an athlete? Were you any good? Oh, baseball. Yeah, I, yeah, I was a good athlete. I was always, a, I played little league um, since I was eight and then played up through high school. I actually played at North Allegheny for a year. And um, uh, I always wore uniform number one or three, cause that was the smallest uniform uh, okay. in little league. So I was always number one. People are like, Oh, you like being number one. I'm like, it's the uniform that fits. But um, yeah, so I played baseball. I mean, wiffle ball. I had epic wiffle ball games, you know, whatever house I, I lived in at the time and would set up a field and we'd get the neighbor kids and even some of the girls involved. And I've actually heard from some of those girls like back in like from 78 and 79 who are like, man, we played wiffle ball and like, I have kids now and, you know, I'll t take them out and play wiffle ball and tell stories. So yeah, always baseball, played football intramurally. I mean, you know, five, six, five, seven, not really going to play on the high school team. Didn't want to play on the high school team. But uh, baseball, yeah, baseball's in my blood. I've been a huge baseball fan my whole life. Well, you guys had a great team over there in North Allegheny growing up. Let me see. Timmy, Timmy Manoa? Did, did Tim Manoa, Ken Rock, all those guys. I mean, Manoa, I think in 83 was my, senior, my sister's senior year. They went undefeated. I think they won the – they won state. They might even have been like USA Today number one. But Manoa averaged like 15 yards a carry. It was silly. And – and North Allegheny at the time didn't have lights at the stadium, which is uh, Newman Stadium. I don't know why Newman's – it's not Newman. What the, what the hell is North Allegheny Stadium? Anyway, it's not Newman. But uh, we would go Saturday afternoon games and see Manoa, and he would just – you know, he'd have like 10 carries for 240 yards. It was just – it was insane. And then Ken Rock was just as good. Yeah. Not as good, but good. And then Manoa went to Penn State, and then he played for the Browns, yep. which I hated seeing him play for the Browns. But I was a Pitt fan, so when he went to Penn State, I was a little upset. But – but as I've gotten older, I, I don't, I don't, you know, the, the hatred for Penn State has dissipated. Like, yeah. I grew up a UCLA fan. It's like USC. I'm like, I admire their uniforms and their program. It's just, you know, I think as you get older, the rivalries die a little bit. Like, I mean, I still hate the, I, well, I hate the Ravens. I always hate the Ravens. But okay. the Browns, I feel sorry for now. But when I grew up, like Brian Sipe and all those teams, like, I hated Cleveland. But now you just, you kind of feel bad for them. But, you know. They're supposedly on their way back. We'll see. Yeah, that's what they say every year. We'll find yeah, I knew I knew last year wouldn't. I knew the sophomore jinx would hit. I knew there was too much pressure on him. First year head coach. I knew the Browns would be a train wreck last year as they were. So it's okay. Uh we'll let them have another shot at it this year. <laughs> I think the Steelers will be a little bit more organized and, and successful. So I mean uh, yeah. You've been in LA for, like we said, over twenty some years, uh, on and off. Um uh, what do you miss most about Pittsburgh, though? I know you say you get back there, but there's got to be something you miss a lot about Pittsburgh. I mean, really just the simplicity of getting around a city. And I know some of you think, oh, you got to deal with the parkway and the tunnels. D don't even start. I mean, 
I grew up in North Hills, so to get to the PNC Park, it was 10 minutes. I mean, 15 minutes. Yeah. Plenty of parking. The stadium's in a great location. Um, I miss going to game. I miss, I miss, you know, just seeing friends. I mean, the typical response is friends, family, uh, but really going to the Steeler and Pirate games and just the neighborhood feel of Pittsburgh where you can go into different pockets and experience all sorts of different ethnic stuff. And, you know, I, I, I miss that. I miss the, the, the easy life, everything's simple, the nicer people. Out here, everyone is, there's so much pressure on everybody. If I don't let my dog out the story, he's gonna have Yeah, yeah. All right, go for it, Dodgy, there you go. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I really miss that. So, uh, and when I get back, I get into that swing and, and it's not the madness of Los Angeles and, and it's just so hard to leave, you know? And, you know, just the seasons, experiencing fall and, and winter and everybody goes, well, yeah, when you come home for Christmas, you get to leave. And I go, yeah, that is the key. But, you know, I mean, it's always going to be, you know, my formative years were there and sure, my family and cousins are all there. I mean, I do have my, my cousin, Greg here, he lives in uh, Calabasas, which is like 25 minutes away. So I have family out here and that really helps. Right. Um, but, you know, especially during this whole quarantine thing, it's like, man, I, I just wish I could hop on a plane or magically transport back to Pittsburgh and see my sister and nephews and my mom. But, you know, unfortunately we can't. So those are the things I really miss. And, you know, watching pirate games now and seeing PNC, it's always great to see the park and everything and sad to see it empty. But of course, we're used to that the past few years. But, um, you know, yeah, I just miss, I just miss being home, the home field to Pittsburgh. I think uh, uh, and per Manny's and a sandwich. I was gonna say, <laughs> how about Kennywood? What's yeah? You know, last time I was home, my sister and nephew and I. It actually just showed up in my Facebook memories. I think it was four years ago. We went to Kennywood and you know, absolute blast and getting on the racer and the Jackrabbit and the Thunderbolt. My nephew was too at the time. He was too short to be on the Thunderbolt. We have a picture of him all dejected. But uh, yeah, that's that's always gonna. I mean, you know, you go to Disneyland and it's just you know, there's ten thousand people and. Not that Kennywood doesn't get crowded, but you don't seem to mind it because you have so many memories there. So, uh, yeah, no, totally miss all the, the Pittsburgh institutions and stuff like that. You've got all those yinzers at, uh, at Kennywood. I'm sure you don't have that at Disneyland. Oh, no, very, no, no, not at all. And it's just, you know, and to just embrace the, the, yinzer, the yinzer stuff, is, it's just great. You just see things and you just laugh and you're like, okay, I'm home. You know, and there's, 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 some, there's a lot of Pittsburgh people out here that we keep in touch about baseball and we text each other and uh, we get together once in a while. But, uh, you know, it's not, even when you get together with Pittsburgh people here, it's still not being like at a bar on the South side or down at station square, or, you know, the North park lounge or something. So it, it's, it's still, you just don't miss that. So you don't hear tough. very many people get called jag offs out there either. Do you? No, not very, you know, you know, and I follow all the, the uh, jag off Instagram. And so they, they do a good job of, of, of posting regularly. John Chamberlain, a comedian who still operates that, still does a really good job. So I, I get my little taste every day of Pittsburgh <coughs> and through Facebook friends. So it's, you know, that's what Facebook's really good for. So you've got a deep allegiance to the, to the Pittsburgh sports. I Why do you name your dog Dodger? <laughs> good question. You know what? Um, when I picked him, when I got him, his name was Badger. I got him from a breeder. He's 16. He'll be 16 in November. So I got him and his name was Badger and he was already answering to Badger and I hated that name, Badger. So I was like, what rhymes with Badger? Some ER. So I was like, app. I started with A, B, C, Kajo and Dodger. Like I went Dodger when I got to D and he looked and I went, all right, it's Dodger. I, you know, uh, I, I thought bucko, but I just didn't, it was stupid. You know, I really did. And uh, it just, Dodger just seemed, plus Dodger dog, wiener dog. It just yeah. kind of fit. And, uh, you know, the Dodgers are my second favorite baseball team. But, I mean, the separation between Pirates and Dodgers are immense. I couldn't tell you any of the Dodger minor leaguers. I could tell you the Dodger minor leaguers the Pirates did not get in the Vasquez trade that we were supposed to. Uh, we were trying to get Lux or, or May, who's, you know, who's unbelievable. Or Ruiz, the catcher, is who I really wanted. And he came up in his first major league at bat for the Dodgers and hit a homer. And, of course, we know where Vasquez is. But, um but I don't, I mean, you know, so I, by the way, I have direct TV, so I watch all the, I, you know, I have the baseball package, so I watch every pirate game just about uh, until I can stomach it. Um, like last night's ball, that clearly looked foul, but, you know, that's par for the course for the Pirates this year. But, but the Dodger games we could never get because they were owned by Time Warner. We, we could never get Dodger games. And uh, you, you'd have to have cable, and I have direct TV. So this year is the first year I've been able to watch Dodger games after a pirate game, and it's really nice. And Boy, Dodger Stadium really is special. I mean, honestly, I think they're the two nicest stadiums. I mean, Dodger Stadium just looks the best on TV. It just, 
you know, the cutouts are cool, but just, you know, Chavez Ravine with the palm trees and yeah. just, I mean, Dodger Stadium, it, it, you know, a lot of people forget it's the third oldest stadium behind Fenway and Wrigley. It's been there since the early 60s and they've updated it, but kept the, the old stadium feel and they've done such a great job. So me and a couple guys, Ed Driscoll, who's a fellow Pittsburgh comic, when he lived out here, he just went back to Pittsburgh, but we used to always catch the Pirate Series, and we have a, a friend, Hugh Fink, a very funny comedian, and he's tight with Charlie Steiner, so we'd get Charlie Steiner tickets for all the Pirate games, which were really nice seats, sure. and we'd go to all the games and watch the Pirate games, and, you know, but I also will go, you know, a handful of times to Dodger Stadium, just because uh, I can get there pretty easily. Actually, Dodger Stadium's not bad. I also have a Vespa that I can tool around on besides a car, so when I go to Dodger games, I can just cut through all the traffic and park by this one dumpster and that's awesome. Walk right in and get out. Um, but if the game goes too late, the shortcut through uh, Griffith Park closes. So I'll either leave a little early or I'll have to get on the freeway for like a little chunk, which you don't want to do at 11 o'clock in L.A. Um, but it's fun. it's fun for me to go to a game by myself once in a while on the Vespa. But, uh, you know, um, that's, a, that's a, you know, so he's Dodger. And, uh, again, Pirates way up here. It's like Pirates are my favorite team. Steelers are 1A. And then you got like the Dodgers down here and pit basketball and, and pit football and, uh, and the Penguins. I mean, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm not a, a huge hockey fan. I watch in the playoffs. I'm not saying I'm a bandwagon fan because I do have the hockey package, but sure. I don't know hockey. I didn't play hockey as a kid. You know, I, you know, I, I threw a football and I shot a basketball, but I, I never had hockey. Um, and then Lemieux came in and of course we all started following, but, but yeah, he's Dodger and, yeah, I always forget that the Dodgers are the team, too. So, I mean, I don't forget, but people have asked me that from Pittsburgh before. Why is he Dodger? I'm like, long story, as I just shared. Lemieux changed that culture uh, uh, of the Penguins. That's why they yeah. have such a mass following now. I mean, what they did this year in the playoffs just broke my heart. My son that – was, that, was, that, that broke that and also broke my, my, my wallet a little bit because I uh, had placed a bet on them against Montreal the last two games. Where they, I just like, well, they're going to win this game, right? But I remember going to Penguin games, you know, there was no baseball around my birthday. I'm born on March 4th. So my dad, we, we always wanted to try to figure out something sports related. So a couple of times we went to uh, Pittsburgh Spirit games to see Stan Terlicki and Paul Child play soccer. And that was kind of cool. And then one year, my friend Don Fusine, his dad took us to a game and we had seats right on the glass. And it was Randy Carlisle and Pat Boutet. Nice. I think Randy Carlisle had been grandfathered in where he didn't have to wear a helmet. And I just thought that was badass. So those were the teams I always remember were Randy Carlisle and Pat Boutet. So that's when I, I first started, you know, that, honestly, that was the first time I ever had been to a hockey game or maybe even watched hockey. And that was probably in the late, uh, mid eighties. And then Lemieux came in. And then of course, you know, it was mid to late. It was, I guess it was early eighties and Lemieux came in. 80. And then of course I was aware of it and I had friends that were diehard. So, you know, you'd go to a party on Friday night to drink beer afterwards and, Penguin games would be on and I would sit down and start to learn some of the, the rules and the, the ins and outs of hockey. And then of course, then they just started to dominate. And, uh, so yeah, so I, I am a fan, but I mean, I'm not like, you know, it's amazing. I don't have any penguin. I have, <laughs> I have a stuffed penguin. I don't have any penguin stuff. There's a lot of bobbleheads up there, as you can see. Yeah. Just, just a stuffed penguin would be the closest I have to any pens merchandise. And then I have this over here behind that TV. There's a lot of Pittsburgh uh, sports cards, and there's a lot of old Penguins, Ron Shook, Dave Burrows, uh, but there's also a lot of Pirates and Steeler cards and that the TV's blocking. But, but yeah, it was heartbreaking, but, you know, I don't take anything to heart like I do with the Pirates and Steelers. I mean, that, that'll ruin my day or ruin my year. So You've got quite the array of Pittsburgh stuff there. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, this is like my little man cave here. So, What's your earliest memory as a Pirate fan? Like when, when, when you were growing um, up? What's I remember – I remember when we still lived in LA, uh, my first ball games would have been Dodger Stadium because we were living here and it was in 70, 76. We went to the Dodger opener. My dad pulled me out of school in 76. And my mom would always write a, a note the next day. I went to the Dodger opener, 76, 77, 78, 79. And the excuse my mom would write the next day to the teacher was Frankie had a fever. And at the time, baseball slogan was baseball fever, catch it. So yeah. my mom felt like she wasn't lying if she said Frank had a fever. But I mean, it was always kids at Dodger Stadium on opening day. And, and I remember in 76, uh, seeing Willie Stargell play and hit a homer. Okay. Um, and, you know, seeing, you know, the windmill with the bat for the first time in person and 
and Parker and, and the, the, the black and yellow and stuff. So even though I, my first games were Dodger games, I knew that I was born in Pittsburgh and my dad instilled in me that the Pirates were my team. So I had Dodger posters like I had Ron Say and Garvey, but I also had Stargell and Parker and, and stuff like that. So, um, and I would listen to Vin Scully every night. Yeah. I had a radio in my room. So we're talking 77 and 78 when the, when the Dodgers went to the series and lost to the Yankees twice. So I hated the Yankees and damn Yankees became my favorite musical. But then in 79, you know, the Pirates, you know, won the World Series. And I remember watching every one of those games. I was able to stay up and because they weren't super late. They weren't super late here. And then we moved back in December of 79. And I got to see the Steelers win a Super Bowl uh, against the Rams in January of 80 on TV in Pittsburgh. And then I uh, got to go to the Pirate home opener in 80. And Sister Sledge was there and lip synced. They lip synced to We Are Family. And then they said, Sister Sledge will now sing the national anthem. And my uncle Joey, who sadly, who passed away a few years ago and was the biggest pirate fan with me and my dad, he goes, are they going to lip sync that too? And I just remember that moment. But, but uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've been to probably over a thousand games. So baseball is just, you know, it's my favorite thing in the world. So that's why it's heartbreaking to see this mess right now. And, you know, they called up Taylor Bachelor today or whatever. You know, they keep bringing up these guys, and this is a cast-off from the Mets, and it's just so disheartening. And then, like, Robbie Erlin, who we, we, we let go, goes to the Braves and pitches, like, you know, four scoreless in his first start. It's like, what, do, what, what, is, you know, what is going on? I don't know. You know, uh, what was a telltale sign? Well, 2020 is still the same for the Pirates. They're, they're no different than what they were in 2019 or 2018, to be honest with you. But a telltale yeah. sign to me was the other day when they tried to sign that guy from the Independent League, and he's like, eh, I think I'm going to go back to the Independent League. Yeah, they said, they said there was a problem with the physical, but you wonder. Yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, because, you know, now that he's been put on the radar by the Pirates to other major league teams to, like, be on the lookout for him with the Milwaukee Milkmen, yeah. maybe now some other team might go, holy shit, maybe the Pirates are on to something. Maybe we try to get him. If he sides up to another team, that's completely what you're saying, uh, for sure. But, you know, it's just – and Mike fulton I don't think he's even signed, you know, the Braves cast off. Why isn't he a pirate? I mean, instead of bringing up this, you know, Del Bozo, as I called him, Del, Del Pozo. Oh, that guy was that, – That was just embarrassing. I mean, he couldn't throw it over the plate. He'd get behind hitters and get afraid to throw it. I mean, just to see this parade of, of pitchers come up from the minors. And literally, the guy they picked up today that the Mets had cut who had an ERA of – you know, in the fives, they say, well, he's under, you know, he's under contract control till 2025. And I go, here we go again. Cause Erlen was a, a, a spring training free agent. So we wouldn't have had any control over him. So you let him go and picked up his bachelor guy because he's under control for four or five more years and he can throw in the mid nineties and he's big and tall, but it's just, it's kind of, you know, the same, it's the same record, you know, it's the same song just uh, played by a different band right now. I feel bad for Shelton and he's probably seeing now what he's in. But that's not a major league team they're running out there. And then the guys we thought they were, you know, Bell, Bell just looks awful. And Polanco, I mean, you know, Greg Brown is the biggest homer for the Pirates next to me, maybe. And when Polanco struck out, when Polanco struck out in the 10th last night, he just went, ugh. Like, he, he, he verbally just went, oh, God. I mean, he's hitting 073 or, you know, I mean, that's, that's just, un, that's just un, I don't know how you keep running the guy out there. But I know they're paying him $7 million, so they have to. But. It's just embarrassing. It's just it's that contract's in albatross too because what do they have like three more years? I, I think like that. I mean, at least two, I think. And then, you know, Bell has just been another guy who looks lost the plate. And you know, whoever he faced last night, I can't remember the reliever's name for the Indians. Bell struck out on three balls right down the middle of the plate. I mean, the last swing and a miss. I mean, these these aren't like breaking balls or something coming in and fooling them. These are balls straight down the middle of the plate. And again, Brown or somebody went right down the middle and he's, he's just missing. And then I don't know if you're familiar with DK sports, but yep. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I read that every day. Like, you know, and so I, I get to keep up, but they just had, they just showed how Bell's hands are different at the plate than last year when he was on the tear. And it's like, if this local reporter seeing that, are the pirates not seeing that and saying something or is Bell, you know, he's always, they call him Tinker Bell, I guess is a little new because he tinkers with his swings a lot, but it's just like, I, you know, he just looks lost and, and Brian Reynolds, who we all wanted to be our favorite pirate this year, when he hit that solo shot the other day, that was his first home run. That was his first RBI. Yeah. You know, 16 games into the season. And this is a guy hitting, you know, high on the lineup. I just, it's, it, it's so disheartening. And then, you know, 
we find a, a hidden gem in someone like, you know, Philip Evans, and then he goes out after colliding with Polanco. You know, I mean, it's, yeah, if Polanco's not hurt, he's hurting somebody else. Huh? He's hurting somebody else, man. And I, he still is so gang. I just don't know how they ever said he was a five tool player. I just, the field, and that slide is almost comical from two years ago. I mean, yeah. it's just, the fundamentals haven't been taught in the minor leagues. And I, you know, I have faith in Charrington. Look, he's not going to fix it in one year. But, you know, I, I really think that Polanco, I, but you, you can't really trade Polanco because you're going to get zero for him. Bell, maybe. I mean, it's a full-blown rebuild. I mean, you got to stock the minor leagues. I know we're, like, already said to have, like, a top five minor league system, which I'm shocked by. But, you know, take those risks on those, like, you know, we did with the Marte trade. But, man, it's just so disheartening just to have to go through this again after we had a really good, solid foundation with a 98-win team. And we go out and, you know, John Neese and Ryan Vogelsong are our starters. So we didn't even improve the team. And it all starts at the top. I mean, it's no mystery. I'm not uncovering anything here. But, but Nutting, I mean, just what is he paying this prorated season? I think it's $24 million. And it shows. I mean, whoa, almost spilled my water. It shows. And if they don't spend any money in the offseason, I mean, that's just, that's just, not, that's just not fair. Yeah. And I'm sure they'll claim – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, the Yankees have more money – on their IL than the Pirates have in their 24-man roster. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, and well, I mean, God, Cole alone is probably making more than the team almost. It's just, it's just the disparity in baseball is sad. And, I mean, there's a way to field a decent product and not spend $250 million like the Yankees. You could spend $100 million and have a solid team that can compete and make your fans sit up. But, I mean, you know, like Cole Calhoun, I was watching – it was at the Diamondbacks side. I had the Diamondbacks and the A's on her for a little bit. Cole Calhoun, a guy who would have been perfect for the Pirates to sign, play right field. He's got like six homers. And he's a left-handed power hitter who could, you know, would have loved the Clemente wall. It's just some of those small risks they could have taken. They just didn't want to. So it's like, okay, well, then, then just get rid of the other pieces because, you know, Keel is going to be gone. And I, I would like to keep Josh Bell. I really would. But I don't know. Unless he's a liability. But you know what, Frank, unless you're going to coach him up, what value does he really bring to that team? And then they got Will Craig. Then we have a number one pick just sitting there doing literally, literally nothing. I know. Because there's no minor league ball. And, you know, he's, he's, you know, he's got a decent glove at first. So why he's not up and, and, and Hayes at third. I mean, yeah, Eric Gonzalez has played well and his exit velocity is good and all that shit. But Eric Gonzalez isn't the long-term – that actually is a guy that could actually get traded probably because he is ripping the ball and, and his barrel, you know, his barrel strength or whatever they call it. You know, when I see, when I, when I see a guy mentioned in an article anymore, I still just want to see average homers and RBIs. So when they put like all the, the new saber metric shit, I get confused. Like, I mean, I know what OPS, I know what it all is, but I, I don't want to see that. But, you know, Gonzalez and then, you know, trade him and let just let Hayes play third. I mean, this is the year, and again, I'm not the only person saying this. This is the year to see what you got, and you know, I don't mind Cole Tucker in center field. That's, but you know, he's got a hit. He will not. Uh, Brian Hayes will not be impacted by the uh, the free agency rule there, where you got to start paying. I don't think so. No, the you'll lose a year of arbitration, but that risk factor there. Just bring him up. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just a really sad situation. And you know, we had something there in the playoffs, and you know, the stupid wild card. You know, we run into Madison Baumgartner and Arietta, two guys just, you know, in, in streaks of pitching that are epic, you know, all-time hot streaks. And, you know, we're out in one game. It's just so – it's pathetic, you know. It's just, it's just I've frustrating. Always, I've always felt the wild card should be a three-game series. Absolutely. Absolutely. You play 162 games and it comes down to one game. And if the other team doesn't have as good a roster, and in some cases they didn't, they, you know, they get a hot starter, and, and, and that's it. And the Pirates came out so tight in those games. I mean, it was just, you know. I knew it was it, when, when uh, Hurdle put uh, Sean Rodriguez at first base. <laughs> yeah. He was in love with Sean. that. He was in love with Sean Rod. You know, and the Phillies, I think he's on the Phillies. I think he's on the injured list. The Phillies have, like, five Pirates. They got, they got Sean Rod, McCutcheon, Walker pitched the other night. Oh, Josh Harrison. Harrison. I mean, the Phillies, it's like, what are you doing? But um, – McCutcheon, I think McCutcheon, I think he was still hitting like under 200. He wasn't hitting real well, but uh, I, I miss Kutch. I always like Kutch. I think we, you know, we had to trade him, but 
Uh, we did get Brian Reynolds for him, but what's that turned into? Who knows? Yeah. But that could be a sophomore slump. But Reynolds, Reynolds just looked so good. And even in Florida this year, watching some of the spring training games, he looked like he was on it. I don't know if he's putting too much pressure on himself or what, but boy, he's looked, he's looked really bad at the plate too. I think the Pirates, if I'm not mistaken, have won seven games. That's including spring training and what they've won to this yeah. It's seven games. Yeah, they won three. They won three. Uh, they won three in spring training. And it's funny because they, uh, at one point when we were like four and 10, the Marlins, no, we were two. We had two wins and the Marlins were four and one and hadn't played in two weeks. They had twice as many wins. And then the Marlins first day back, they sweep a double header. So I remember posting something about the Marlins have as many wins as us in one day and they haven't played for 10 days. So it's just, you know, you know, and Shelton's made some, and Shelton, who I wanted to believe in and, I still do. I mean, look, it's his first year, but boy, he's made some really bad moves he's, that have been magnified. So he shows uh, his rookie managing, and he yeah. got a lot of credit. He got a ton of credit for that Minnesota team. For the Twins, yeah. You know, and if that's the case, I mean, at least make some good moves. I, I think there was. A, I, I haven't paid much. I mean, I've been watching the score and stuff like that, but uh, I have not turned them on in about a week and a half. And well, you know, they lost the whole Cincinnati or the uh, St. Louis series, but like. Put the same lineup out there a few days in a row. That's, that's not new. That's so frustrating. I, I mean, not done that yet. And that really. I mean, I mean Leland's lineup. You know, you knew. You know, you knew Leland's lineup before the game started. You know, he might throw Gary Reedus in there, or you know, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess a lot of teams don't do this. I, I know it's a new thing, and but when I hear them say, "Well, we got to give them rest and rest," and it's like rest, what? It's <laughs> playing 60 games, guys. Yeah, you're playing 60 games, and then, oh, I got to watch out for tissue injuries. These guys were supposed to be working out. I, I don't know. They're professional athletes. Put your best. Put your best nine guys out there. Exactly. And even like Chuck Tanner, you know, don't go lefty righty crap on me every time. Go with your gut. Go with the eye test. I don't know. It's 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 just frustrating. And like you know, they're playing Cleveland today. I think Brault's starting, and I'll watch the game. You know, I will. Because I'm a glutton for punishment, but it's just you know. And last night, like I got disgusted, and I'm like, "Well, I'll put the Laker game on." And of course, they choked. So it's a bad sports day here for me. Because uh, I do like the Lakers. I mean, I, even when I lived in Pittsburgh, the Lakers were all my friends like the Sixers, and I I like the Lakers from when I grew up out here a little bit. Yeah. So everyone's like, "Oh, you moved to LA and became a Laker fan." I'm like, "No, no, no. I was a Laker fan, Magic rookie year, and all that." But uh, between the Lakers, Pirates, and the the Penguins. You know, it's been it's been a rough comeback to, from sports. Yeah. And I'm a Lakers fan myself. I grew up like in the Lakers, just like yeah. You know, uh, we had no basketball in Pittsburgh. You know that. I know that. Uh, the closest thing we have is really good pit basketball teams for a while. I, I'm telling you, we had that, and we had the fish that say Pittsburgh, which I have the DVD up there. But uh, Demetrius Gore, Charles Smith, uh, Jerome Lane, like those teams were that. I mean, pit basketball was so good back then with like Paul Evans and I guess those were actually the guys was it Roy Roy Chipman brought in but like Charles Smith, Jerome Lynn, Jason Matthews, Sean Miller, uh who was the left hander that could shoot? Uh they had so many good guys, man. Then Bobby Martin. Oh my God. I, I loved pit basketball. But those that's what really got me really super excited about college basketball were those pit teams. So much fun and you know broke our hearts every year. Broke our hearts every year. But uh uh, the Lakers, though, man, I mean, they were five for 32 from three-point land last night. So, I mean, they have no th – Danny Green's supposed to be their guy, and it's not going to happen. But I love about the Lakers. They'll be fine. They'll I be fine. I was an albatross because I really – I like LeBron. I like the team they put around him. And like you said, I, I've always been a Lakers fan, so I, I really want to see him get another one. Um, yeah, I think – I think uh, it was a wake-up call. I mean, the, the Milwaukee lost as well, you know. Uh, so – these teams that, are, that came in hungry playing for a re I mean, Portland had to play hard from day one. After the Lakers clinched the number one seed, you know, they sat guys. They kind of, you know, again, this is like playing the Cubs with Arietta. They come in, he's a wild card. You get a hot team. I mean, Damon Lillard is, is insane right now. So we'll see what happens there. But uh, Who's your uh, that's hard growing up. What's that? Your favorite pirate growing up, who was it? Um, I loved, well, I mean, okay, when I was a kid, kid, I mean, okay, Willie Sargell, but when, when I started to be old enough and I was playing the game and everything, I loved Jason Thompson and Johnny Ray. Uh, Pena was up there. 
Rick Roden, uh, my, my dad, my family, we owned a, a, a video store uh, on McKnight Road in the early 80s, which oh, was okay. one of the first ones. So a lot of the pirates came in. So Johnny Ray would come in, Jason Thompson, and when he would come in, I, I brought like all my Jason Thompson cards from News with the Tigers and signed a bunch for me. And so I remember when he hit 31 homers and had 100 RBIs one year. So that was like a big thing, big thrill. Is it 30 and 101 or 31 and 100? I don't remember. But um, I love Thompson. And I played second base in high school in Little League. So I liked Johnny Ray a lot. And he was a switch hitter. And, you know, he had pop and such a solid hitter and should have won rookie of the year and got robbed by Steve Sachs. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, those guys, I mean, uh, uh, boy, there were so many. Um, and then from that, I mean, I liked, uh, I mean, Marvell Wynn. I mean, I liked all those guys. I mean, all those teams that started to help us get good again and then I mean and then uh, well you know what my all-time favorite player for the Pirates was probably Vince like uh, I love Vince like um Somehow so say that well yeah when I was super young it was it was Jason Thompson and Johnny Ray but you know early 90s and stuff I mean Bonds and Benia obviously but Vince like everyone loved Vince like uh Lee Lacey was another guy I liked as a kid and um Mike Eastler Eastler the hip you know what? I like Eastler, but he's the one person that turned me down for an autograph. Now it might be my fault. Here is the situation. I'm at a pirate game and we got I got seats behind the plate all the time from Rick Roden. Okay. Who came into the video stop, which was the name of our store. He'd, he'd leave tickets for me all the time. And I'd be like, Well, you don't have to leave. He goes, Look, I don't have anybody else out here. Every game, you want to come to every game, I will leave tickets for you. So me and my buddies from high school would go and we'd, you know. We'd sit behind the plate, and uh, it was great. Um, oh, that actually, when I was in high school, it was Nagel. That's what, Nagel was after high school. I got to be friends with Danny, really. Uh, we're still good friends. But I remember I was behind the plate once, and Eastler was on the DL. He was hurt. And back then, uh, it was very strange. Mike Eastler was on the DL, hurt, but he's sitting in the, in the stands uh, with, like, his wife or whatever. I don't know. Um, and he was eating a giant hamburger. I mean, I don't – I don't, I mean, I don't think you're allowed to when you're on the DL sit in the stands anymore. I think you can sit in the dugout. But this was like early 80s. It was a different time. So I saw him get up and run to the restroom at one point. I'm like, this is my chance to ask Easel for his autograph. And it was in right, right behind the plate on the first level, field level. It's a huge, it was where the huge snack bar was. It was a big snack bar. It was Three Rivers. And Easel came walking by, and maybe he saw me scouting him out. I said, hey, Hitman, or hey, Mr. Easler, can I get your autograph? And without breaking stride, he went, no, really kind of coldly and meanly. And I never forgot that. So when Brian Reynolds threw out four runners at the plate this year in the first 10 or 11 games, they said he ties the record. And I was like, wow, someone else. And they go by Mike Easler. And I was like, ah, oh, that bastard. But it's still the one thing that comes into my head is how he turned me down for an autograph. Now, again, he wasn't in uniform. He's trying to watch the game. But I mean, would have that really hurt him to just quickly – I don't even think anyone realized it was him or if they did, they didn't care. But it was just like, I'll never forget that. So that was always one thing that bothered me. He was a great player. I loved his stance. I loved everything about him. But he did, he's the only person who's ever said no to him. He could hit the ball. He was always a consistent. The hit man. Yeah, but he was great. Uh, I loved him. But that was the one, the one in, my one run in with Mike Easler was that. So this current situation that we just talked about, you, you really put your feelings on the line here. Do you think this is a fallout from Huntington, or do you think this is where Charrington's going to be taking them? I, I think it's, it's everything. I mean, Huntington, I mean, it, you know, the, the numbers don't lie. The drafting, the players they drafted and taken like, you know, you know, the players we took, Bullington and Moskis, that was that maybe even Littlefield, I don't even know. But, but regardless, the, the, the drafting by – by uh by Huntington and, and Kyle Stark the fact that that guy had a job as long as he did with the whole military training thing and waking guys up to you know go on five mile ride I mean that whole military thing that hey a ho or hey ho whatever that that whole thing they brought in and, and Kyle Stark continually never had anything good happen just horrible scouting horrible player development I mean these guys would come up and I'm always puzzled when guys don't know how to run the bases or, or don't know how to slide like Polanco. I mean, that's stuff you learn when you're eight in T-ball. Dyson did it last night. I know. I know. Did it last night. He might – him, I'll give him – I'll give him a pass, and it's a one-time thing. But when you, 
repeatedly. I mean, Marte, Sterling might have, Marte might have been the worst base runner of all time. I mean, I mean, every time he did something good, I mean, he would make two bonehead plays on the play on the bat, on the on the pads, base pads. I mean, the fundamentals, and then you know, Goey Cora at third, waving everybody in all the time, like waving Stallings in this year. I mean, there's just. I can't believe Cora lasted. I don't know. They cleared house and they left Cora at third. I don't know why, but um, I, I mean, again, you got to give Charrington three to five years, I guess. And everyone raves about the, the Travis Williams guy that came from the Penguins. I don't know enough about him when he was with the Pens. I just think you kind of want a career baseball person there, but I, I don't know. But apparently this guy's great and, you know, he'll sit and talk with you. I guess he's more of the business operation side. And, he is. He's you know, a yeah. And Charrington has the track record in, in Boston and even in Toronto. So, you know, you got to give him time. But I think he's quickly learning that, oh, shit, my boss is not going to give me any money. <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, you know, everyone wants nothing to sell the team, which I have a guy, a friend who, uh, you know, has heard personally you know, he's not going to sell the team. He wants it for his kids. He's never going to do it. And I'll tell you a funny story. I, you know, as a comedian, as I also do audience warm up in LA a lot uh, on TV shows. And I was doing warm up for a show called Brain Games that aired on uh, Discovery Channel last year. And Keegan Michael Key hosted it. And I've known him off and on for a So it was fun talking to him. But we'd have celebrity guests come in, like Jack Black or uh, Ted Danson and Kristen Bell and Dak Shepard. Well, one day Mark Cuban was there. Oh, by the way, Drew Brees was on the show too. And he was throwing footballs to people in the audience during a commercial break. So I'm like, oh shit, I got to catch a ball from Drew Brees. So I'm like, Drew, I'm going down and out. And I ran a pattern. He hit me and I tapped my toes. And, you know, that was, that was good. I mean, it was like, I got a pass from a Hall of Famer, you know? I, I wish I would have handed my phone to somebody and say, please record this. But I have the memory of uh, me catching a ball from Drew Brees. But pretty cool. McCuban was, McCuban was on the show and I went up to him on a commercial break. I went, hey, North Allegheny graduate, and he went to Mount Lebanon, I believe. And yeah. he went, oh, Pittsburgh. You know, we started talking, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. And I said, and the Pirates came up. And I, I'm sure it's a question he hears every day. And I don't think I just flat out, you know, like a total injury, like, why don't you buy the Pirate? I was like, yeah, the Pirate situation. He goes, hey, man. And he called me Frank. He goes, you know what? I'll tell you, Frank. He goes, they won't. He goes, I, I, I'll never get the team. He goes, nothing is never going to sell that team. He goes, I've tried. I've tried. Not going to happen. He goes, and this was the analogy. And I heard him use it later on on someone else's podcast or somewhere he goes he goes hey if you had to stand out in the middle of the street and have people yell at you and tell you how awful you were and how bad you were but you made 20 million dollars a year would you do it i went yeah and he goes there's your answer he goes that's what he's doing he goes he doesn't care he doesn't care which is sad um it's all about the it, and that, that's straight from cuban i mean that's great from mark cuban who knows the inside scoop that yeah. you know he said I, i've tried it's not going to happen it ain't gonna happen. It, it's it, you know, to me, the community needs to revolt. I went to a game last year. Um, I got some pre tickets from somebody who, who was able to hook me up. So I took my son. My son and I hit different baseball. He's ten, so we okay. go to different baseball stadiums and stuff. He collects these little bats, all nine yards. That's awesome. We went to ten, I think ten stadiums last year. Oh wow! And um, between minor league, major league, the whole nine yards. And we had the worst experience at PNC with the people there, the camaraderie. Yeah. So I took my son up to get his little bat. We went up there. He got his little bat. And he said, Dad, I'm going to go sit back down. So he goes and sits down. I start talking to the guy who, who was there. And he told me that he's been a vendor there for a long time. He was at Three Rivers Stadium. He's a retired guy, lives in Florida. But he flies back in the summer to, to continue being a vendor. And I said, yeah, that's really cool. And I said, so what's the inside scoop? I said, you know, people are just so, uh, this is the most difficult place we've been to. Nobody's friendly. I said, and that's just so on Pittsburgh like to me. And he said, that's just the aura that they cast upon us. He said, yeah. nobody is friendly. Even the players, there was a rain delay and there were a bunch of players running along the, the outfield warning track. And I saw Trevor Williams speak with one family and it's only because they threw a glove onto the field. He picked it up and threw it back to him. None of those guys stopped to interact with the fans, nothing mm. like that. But yeah, we were going to places like Toronto and their, their young superstars were coming over the fans, interacting. Really? With um, it was just real disappointing to see. I'll tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story. And I have this baseball right on my desk. 
Um, I'm going to put my ceiling fan on. Hold on a second. Yeah. Even though, you know, it's 110 degrees out right now in Studio City, California, and even though I have the air conditioner on, it's just like, it's just like it, it, it's still draining. It's so hot. So, okay. <laughs> so if I can put my ceiling fan on up there, there, that helps a little bit. All right. So anyway, I have a baseball right here. Okay. And you see the palm tree. So that's yeah. spring training. And uh, it doesn't say Orioles on there. Okay. So two years ago for my birthday, me and some friends went down to spring training. And it was shocking that I had never done Bradenton. I, we, all of us were around the same age. We're like, why have we never done it? I'm like, all right, for my birthday, we're going. Um, so we get down there, uh, we're waiting for everybody the next day and a friend of mine, Frank Mergy in Pittsburgh, he got there a day early and we were sitting in, uh, Bradenton and the pirates were off that day or they were, they were away somewhere. And, uh, we were looking at our phones. I almost said the newspaper, but no one's looking at the paper. So we're looking at our phones and I go, Oh my God. I go, dude, the Orioles are playing today. The game starts in like an hour and they play in Sarasota. Now, if you're not familiar with how it is, but Bradenton and Sarasota, when you, when you go to the, see the Pirates in spring training, you fly into the Sarasota airport, you know, yeah. and then you take a, you know, an Uber to Brainton. It's like 20, 30 minutes, maybe. Sure. So we, we finished eating and we're like, we're going to an Orioles game. This will be cool. So we go to an Orioles game and we go up to the window and there was the first inning. The game had just started. And uh, um, there were two women at the, at the gate, or at the gate, at the ticket window. And they're talking and talking. We're kind of standing there like, you know, we just want to grab any two seats and get in. And the one woman turns, didn't even see us behind her because they were talking about buying tickets for games upcoming and we're going, oh my God, we just want to get in right now. Yeah. Woman turns and sees us, goes, oh, oh, sorry, so sorry. Are you guys going to the game right now? We go, yeah, she goes, here. She goes, two box seats, go. And we're like, oh my God, this is great. So she hands us two box seats. We walk in, we're on the uh, first base, uh, first base right field line. I, have you been to spring training before? I have. It's great. I mean, you're, you're, never, you're never packed in there. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're, we have like a section to ourself and to the right of us, uh, like I said, we're past first base bag in right field and the whole section's empty there. And I say to my buddy, we're going to get a foul ball, you know, and then like literally two batters later, a guy hits a ball and it's hit over our head and it rattles around the chairs and I run over and pick it up. I'm like, Oh my God, I got a baseball. Right. And the, uh, the usher comes over to check on you because they, they want to see if anyone's heard and, you know, they give the thumbs up like they do at PNC. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, he goes, you guys are Orioles fans. We said, actually, not, not really. It's, you know, we said, we're, we're pirate fans. We're like, hey, we got you in you know, the World Series in 71 and 79. You know? And the guy goes, well, I live in Brainton. I'm actually a really big pirate fan. And I went, you know, I said, huh, that's interesting. Well, why are you ushering at the Orioles games and not the pirate games? And he goes, the pirates don't pay their ushers a dime to work the games. He goes, and the Orioles give us a little money. So it was an easy choice for me. And I turned to my buddy and I just went, is that not perfect? Is that just not amazing to hear that these guys who are retired and they're lifelong baseball fans, we sat and talked with this guy about Mike Flanagan and Scott McGregor. He talked about the World Series in 79. He was, a, he was a Pirate fan. He liked the Orioles too, but he was a Pirate fan and lived in Bradenton, drives to Sarasota, again, 20 minute drive, to work at the Oriole games instead of the Pirate games, which he'd rather work, but he doesn't get paid. And he goes, yeah, I don't know of any other teams that really don't pay the ushers. And again, I didn't ask what this guy was getting paid for the Oriole game. What's he getting? 25 bucks, 50 bucks? I don't know. Yeah. But at least he was getting something and showing a little respect or just like, you know, hey, you're working, you're representing the team. And, and we've all done jobs, especially, in, you know, if I do a job where I'm getting paid well, you're always happier. You know, a good crew is a happy crew. You're doing it. You're, you're, you're like, oh, I'm appreciated. And when you're underpaid or undervalued, you're not as, you know, you're, you're a little, there's a little chip on your shoulder. I mean, I, that just to me was just so amazing to hear that the Pirates didn't pay and the Orioles did. And I just, I never forgot that. And it's just ridiculous. Try being a teacher for a career. I know. <laughs> you, you told me. I know. That's got to be It's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. yeah I know. That's, I teach. They just told us, you're not getting a raise. You're not getting a cola this year. Okay. Jesus. I, I, I know. I love, my, I love my job. That's why I do it. But I love doing this too. So who knows? What do you um, teach? What do you teach? I actually teach uh, physical education, okay, honors health, and first aid. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. so I, I love what I do. I don't have a problem yeah. getting up and going to work. In fact, I miss it a lot. Yeah, but, uh, know. you know, it's it's just at what point should people in America understand that we serve a real purpose out there? You know, it used to be the saying, 
uh, those who can do, those who can't teach. And it's not really true. No, I no, no, I agree. Figured that out uh, in the spring when they had to work with their kids, where they, if they did in the <laughs> spring, they're going to figure it out now because if any time, yeah, uh, maybe one tiny, tiny silver lining to this whole thing, exactly, is that they are underappreciated. You guys are. Anyway. Who's, who's your favorite pirate right now? That's funny. Uh, oh. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I, it's probably still Brian Reynolds. I mean, even though he's having a horrible year, I'm not going to be some fair weathered fan. I just liked his approach last year and, you know, fundamentally sound and plays the outfield well. And, you know, the guy is not, boy, you know, he just does his job and, you know, he's very quiet even in pregame and postgame interviews, but just goes about his job the right way and was, and was taught the fundamentals the right way by the Giants, yeah. <laughs> not our minor league system. Right. But, you know, just, just, you know, just he showed so much poise at the plate and the guy was in a batting race until, you know, the last three weeks of the season as a rookie, you know, it's, it just doesn't happen. And usually the league figures out the holes in your swing and adjust. Maybe that's what they're doing this year. I just think he's trying too hard or pushing, but I mean, he just, he's looking so bad pitches. He's swinging at this year. He didn't last year. So, I mean, it, you know, I, I, Newman's Newman's hitting like 400 over his last 10 or 12, you know, 10 games or something after a slow start. And I played short and second like him. I want to like Cole Tucker a lot because he's so, you know, he's such a great personality. And it's the personality they need. And this, yeah, the, and baseball needs those faces and teams need those faces, you know, like a Tatis, you know, in San Diego, who I've been watching a lot of Padre games, who by far right now have the best uniforms I've ever seen. They're, they're yellow and brown, and then at home they have the pinstripes with the white. Padres uniforms are so good right now. Yeah. Um, but they've been playing the Dodgers a lot, so I've been seeing them play a lot, and they, they're just, you know, they're stacked with young talent. Um, but, you know, I want to say, Ren, I mean, no one on the pitching staff, are you kidding me? Uh, I mean, Musgrove, Musgrove's not a number one. He wants to be a number one. Then the Pirates tell us, oh, he's out with a heel injury, but then he goes on the DL with, is it a, a wrist or a four? You know, so that was a lie. Um, Trevor Williams seems like a bull. I mean, I, you know, I like those guys. I don't hate any pirates. Polanco, I don't, I don't hate anybody, but God. I don't think the season would be any different, even if they had Tyon or Archer, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, no, I, they might have, they might have two more wins, three more wins. I don't know. Ty, I would think Tyon would have maybe a win or two, but, but I guess Brian Reynolds, I mean, I, 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 um, God, it's funny. I'm going around the diamond. I mean, it's not JT Riddle. It's not Jordan Tyson. I mean, I mean Reynolds. I think a lot of people would say is their favorite player because he represents hope for the future Pirate fans. So I'll say Reynolds. But I mean, it's not like you know. I think uh, Jared Dyson lost me the, the minute they interviewed him, and he was. Uh -huh. I had to sign somewhere. Yeah, wasn't a whole I, lot out there. Personally, I would have cut him. Personally. Yeah, yeah, but he had signed a two million dollar deal. Yeah, hey, it wasn't a whole lot out there, so I figured, what the heck. And you know, after last night's. I think DK put it best after last night's little mistake Walker. second base. Yeah. He probably should have been DFA because he should know better. He's been in the league long enough. I, and that's, that's his forte. You know, when the Royals won the World Series, he was the designated pinch runner. Like, that's – you're Matt Alexander of the, of the 79 Pirates, you know. Like, that's you're – you're here. You're on the roster to pinch run or be uh, a base runner. And they say what a great guy is in the clubhouse and – you know, the players are drawn to him, and that's great and everything. But, you know, he's also hitting, I think, 100. I think his average is one. He may, is he even at that? You know, I like don't know. I think up with the ball in play. Polanco might be the only guy under. But, you know, it's just, it's just a tragedy of, of error. It's just – I don't know why. Like, my buddy will tune out. He's like, how do you stay tuned watching the games? And I say, well, I'll take the dog to the park, and, you know, I'll, I'll work here, but I'll always have it on the TV in the background. But when he's it's thinking hard. Funniest thing I heard about uh, somebody say about Jared Dyson, they said, uh, can he still first base? Because that might be the only way he gets on. Yeah. To me. I mean, but he, and he also, I just, every time I, he, you know, he's always been just kind of a slap hitter and, you know, at 36, he's lost a step. They say he's still like one of the fastest guys in the league. That's fine. But, you know, always just trying to like, just drive the ball into the, I don't know. I, I don't, maybe he should bunt more. I'm surprised. Again, no one bunts anymore. Uh, but you know Reynolds the other day when he was up, they had the, they had him, they had three fielder. He was hitting lefty. They had three infielders on the right side. And the, again, I'm just like, how do you not keep them honest? I don't know the shifts and all that stuff. I you know.
Move All right, on, last Roger. power question for you. Yeah. We're going to talk a little bit Steelers and maybe a little Penguin. Sure. Um, three things, hypothetically, you would do to change this Pirate team. I, I don't think it's anything different. I mean, you, you, you got to spend, you, you, you have to, you have to bring in at least one decent free agent signing. Give me one $50 million contract for three years. Someone that can come in and immediately give your team respect. But it's also when you bring in somebody like that, it shows a commitment to other free agents and go, Oh, well, maybe this is an environment that wants me and wants me to come there again. Uh, you know, Kevin Millar, who the pirates probably would have been better off at center field signed with Boston. Boston's almost as bad as us, but at least it's the Red Sox. You know, everyone's like, oh, well, why didn't the Pirates sign him? The Pirates wanted him. He didn't want to come here. I don't blame um, him. They show no commitments to winning. Um, secondly, you know, Polanco, they got to give up on the Polanco experiment. I know they won't. He's under contract. He's making too much. They keep dropping him in the order. But, I mean, when, Greg, when you lose Greg Brown as a fan, you've hit rock bottom. Um, and I just think they, uh, you know, get, I mean, get rid of Joe Block. <laughs> I can't stand Joe Block on the games. I thought Tim Neverett was going to be the guy I hated the most that did Pirate games. But Joe Block just thinks he's so clever. He's always secretly rooting for the Brewers where he came from. He grew up a Tiger fan. And in that Tiger series, you could tell he was still rooting for the Tigers. I don't know. I mean, I actually thought Mike McHenry as a studio host last year was, was not great. He was always like at a 10 energy level, even after a loss. And he would use a lot of, I actually have enjoyed McHenry in the booth because at least he brings a little refreshing take on the games. Yeah. But Joe Block bothers me. I love Greg Brown. I, I, I love Walk, I, you know, Wayner. And I like all those guys. I miss Blass. I miss Lenny for Terry, for God's sakes. But um, I just, they, they just, and thirdly, if, if I haven't given enough answers, they got to repair, you know, the relationship with the fans, which is what I thought Travis Williams was going to do and Charrington and they're trying. But Charrington's a robot, man. He's not a personality. He's not, excuse me, be the guy that's going to come out and say, come out to the ballpark. You know, he's kind of a quiet guy and goes about his work, which is fine. Let him do his thing. But, you know, next year will be really interesting because they got to do, they got to do more to bring the fans back. There's got to be, you know, more, promo not promotions, but they just, there, there's something they got to do. I mean, there's such, a, there's such a hatred for that, that team in that town right now. Here's something to think about. Pittsburgh Pirate fans are have gonna been away from the baseball park for well over a year by the time yeah. the season opens next year. Yeah. They are going to find something else to do. Yeah. And if they enjoy what they're doing aside from watching the Pirates, yeah. they're not gonna go back to that ballpark. And it's a shame because as we know, and we're all biased, but it is the most beautiful ballpark in the country. Um, but you know, even, you know, when I came back the past few years, when I come home, me and my buddies, I'll, I'll get free tickets from somebody or, or, you know, we'll just buy a ticket. We never even really even sat in our seats. We would just kind of stay up at the tables and yeah. drink a lot of beer and eat food. And, you know, there's four sections in front of us. We'd kind of go on the third baseline and there was nobody there anyway. And then if the game got close in the seventh, you know, the eighth or ninth, we'd go sit down and they'd cut off beer sales. So why hang out at the top anymore? But, um, it's just, you know, it's such a beautiful ballpark. They, they, you know, the food's good and they do all that stuff. But, you know. I live 50 minutes from uh, Oriole Stadium, Camden Yards. Oh, yeah? I live in Frederick, Maryland. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I love going to the games there. And we've got a minor league team in the town that we're fighting to keep here. It was one of those teams that they want to cut out of baseball. But yet they drew 250,000 fans last year. Yeah. Their minor league ballpark. So Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I, hey, I have, you, li you live in Frederick? Yeah. My girl, Courtney, are you awake? My girlfriend's from Frederick. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Small world. I forget her high school. Hold on one sec. Courtney. What? Hey, he's a comedian. What do you want? Tuscarora. She went to Tuscarora High School. Okay, on the other side of town. I, okay. I had one daughter graduate from TJ this year, and I have another one that graduates from Thomas Johnson next year. Okay. That's just such a small world. So yeah. Um, yeah. she's, uh, you know, she, she's not a big baseball fan, but she does like the – oh, I can't say the team. That's, I can't say that. She does uh, like the Washington football team. Oh. Uh, not the Ravens, thankfully, so that's good. So that keeps things peaceful here. But, um, yeah, I don't know. The Pirates, it's just, you know – I think we, uh, you know, Mark, I, like we all know what needs to be done. And 
everyone looking in the ex everyone knows it's you get you got to spend some money and not not stupidly spend it wisely and they're developing the farmly but i do think they just gotta they gotta go out and at least try i mean bringing in like you know philip evans worked out okay they got lucky he hit well for a dozen games but when i see jt riddle and you know guys like that in the lineup you know it's just it's just so you know Who's the other guy catching? I don't even. I can't even remember his name. Oh yeah, J Murphy, Jack Murphy, something Murphy. Yeah, John Ryan Murphy. He sounds yeah. like a serial like killer. Two hundred. Yeah, I, you know, and I remember he had three homers in spring training. I think he had three. He had four hits, and three of them were homers. Probably like he's got some pop. Right? What's that again? I said probably batting against A level guys. Oh yeah, no guys that work at Midas right now. Yeah, exactly. But right. um, yeah, I just it's just uh, you know. I, I will I will be a fan, and all these fans that say they're not going to watch, I'm still going to watch. Um, I don't live there, so I'm not really giving them any money, I guess. But uh, when I do that, I'm wearing a pirate hat for God's sakes. Uh, and when I come to town, I I go to games. I schedule my trips around a homestand. So, but you know, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm going to skip over the Penguins just because we talked some about them. Yeah, and I'm yeah. I know how disappointing it had to have been, even though you weren't a big Penguin fan. Yeah. Um, it's it just so disappointing for the city up there. But I'm going to talk about the Steelers a little bit. Um, yeah. Do you think this NFL season is going to fly in its entirety? I mean, college is already calling it off. Um, I and what's your expectations? I mean, Ben's back. And yeah. It's better than ever. Which Well, I mean, our expectations have to be that Ben's back and better than ever because without him, they didn't do anything to sure up behind him. I mean. I do think Mason Rudolph is still a good quarterback. I mean, we saw him light up Pitt for 400 yards in the first half. If you watch Pitt football, and you know he he looked okay. And he he was he played well, but he you know they threw him into the fire. I mean, not everyone's a first round draft pick that can come into the league and you know perform at a high level like uh, Mahomes or whatever. But um, yeah, it's all on Ben. I mean, but boy, you know you, you forget their defense. I mean, I I just saw a thing on ESPN. They're, they have them pegged as the number one defense right now, and they really are. They're getting to it back, and, you know, you got Hayward in a contract year who's going to play his ass off. He always has. Um, and you got Fitzpatrick back there, and you got Edmonds with another year. By the way, I just saw Artie Burns ripped his ACL with the, with the Bears and is out for the year. Hargrave got hurt too. What's that again? Oh, Hargrave hurt his leg yesterday. Oh, did he really? Wow. Um, and I saw Gerald McCoy, he ripped his, uh, his, uh, his quad with the Cowboys and they cut him. And I thought that was illegal, but they had a clause and the, the Cowboys had a clause that if he injures his quad, he can be cut and he gets to keep the 3 million signing bonus. Cause when I saw he was cut, I was like, no, you can't do that. But they had it built in. But anyway, um, it was only that easy to make 3 million bucks huh? I made three. He could have faked it. Oh, my quad. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the Steelers, you know, I, again, Every year I predict Super Bowl, you know, like every homer. But I really think they have a shot. It's all up to Ben. And, and you know, Ben is lighter. And, you know, he says he's in the best shape of his life. And, and his arm, they're saying he's snapping it. And you can hear the ball. So, I mean, you know, it, it, it's no secret. He is everything on offense for that team. I mean, you're talking about a Hall of Famer here. Um, and they can protect him. And. They got the – I mean, this is – you know, their window's closing. They got a two-year window. He says he still wants to win multiple Lombardis. I, I, I do see him still playing two or three years unless he falls apart. But, you know, he hasn't been hit a lot, you know, the last couple of years, and that's good. Um, especially and, last year. Especially last year. He was barely hit. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm so excited. It's, it's Monday Night Football, I think, against the Giants on the 14th of September is the opener. And I really hope they play. I mean, I think we all need football. The fact they're not a bubble league, I guess it's, it's just too many people and too many players. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Hard Knocks. I don't know if you're watching Hard Knocks on HBO. Yeah, I, um, do, I do catch some episodes. Yeah, last night was the second episode, and it's, it's the Chargers and the, the Rams. And I, I like their – I always liked the Rams, too, even as a kid. Um, so, you know, they're showing the face masks and the mouth – you know, the stuff, the pre preventative stuff. Obviously, football, more than any sport, except for maybe, what, wrestling? I mean, the contact is repeated by – 22 players every play and spitting and sweating. I mean, there people are going to come up with it. I mean, it's going to happen. I mean, 
I, I hope they – I really, really – I think we all really need football, especially in Pittsburgh where the Penguins got jolted out of the playoffs early. The Pirates are not even a major league team. I mean, if you're a sports fan like myself and not working, God, you know, you, 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 you look – we've always looked at football. We've always looked to the fall and the Steelers, but this year more than ever. So I think they're going to do what it takes. And, you know, the, the bubble seems to work for, you know, no positive tests for football and ba- basketball. But, you know, they're talking about the playoffs for baseball being, you know, trying to bubble the teams there, but then, you know, get to play in the home parks. That would, that would suck. But you got 16 teams that you got to bubble there. So what, they added teams I, I know. stadiums. I mean, that's so many, so many. And baseball games are a lot longer than a, than a hockey game or, a, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, it's, it definitely it's, seems impactful. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays itself out. There's 16 games in an NFL I don't season. Wanna, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I think I have to sneeze. <laughs> I you. covered my mouth. I covered my mouth safely for you, Mark. Um, yeah, I just, the uh, 16 games, I mean, but then you're looking at, you know, 19 you know, to get to the Super Bowl, it's it's going to be, I don't know. No, I don't think anyone knows. I mean, I really want it. Uh, look, I would even want Pitt. I mean, ACC still talking about playing, right, Not, or just a conference schedule. I want it. Uh, I, I, I just think a lot of people, I hate to use the word need, but, you know, Pittsburgh is one of those towns where just football, you know, you, I go to other cities as a comic traveling, and you'll see people walking around wearing, the local sports team a lot. Denver, Denver has a lot of people displaying their Broncos stuff. But I mean, in Pittsburgh, every per- it's every person is wearing a Penguins or a Steelers jersey. I mean, it's just that's the way we were raised there, the blue collar mentality. And we just I, I want the Steelers, and I, I think the offense. I think Juju was had a terrible year, but then again, you know, look what look what was thrown to him and. I think he, I, I, everyone, they keep on saying that Johnson's going to be the breakout guy. He sure looked like it. I mean, the separation he would have, I guess he led the league in uh, yards, most yards separated from, you know, a defender, like five yards on his reception. Something crazy. Steelers know how to work those, those third, fourth round pick receivers. So I think it's going to be a great year. I mean, I think Baltimore can't do what they did last year. I think some teams are going to learn how to maybe – better defend Lamar Jackson. There's no way he can do that again. Is there? I don't know. But it's amazing. I think Cam Hayward said, yeah, I got a lot of sacks coming up against Heisman Trophy winners. Every guy in our division has won a Heisman Trophy. You got Burrow, Mayfield, and, and that's, that's tough competition there in Jackson. So, you know, I just – even if the, I, the Steelers go 10-6, and six, you know, I think they're in the playoffs. I think they're a playoff team, and I think they can win it. I mean, there's no dominant – I just, the Ravens, I, I can't give them, I'm not going to give them any credit or praise them at all. So, but I think, uh, I think if Ben, I mean, you know, we've seen those cryptic videos where he's throwing, throwing, throwing. Let's see him air it out a few times and stuff. And if he says he's ready, I, you know, the fact, you know, look, Kevin Colbert and those guys, they know what they're doing. So if they didn't go out and get a real experienced veteran, they must know that, you know, Ben's ready and they're, they're confident with Mason Rudolph. Steelers rarely make mistakes. There's a Rod Woodson once in a while they make a mistake with and Hardy Nickerson or guys they let go. But the Steelers have rarely made mistakes in, in not being prepared or letting go. Well, not being prepared last year, maybe. but It's interesting to say about Rod Woodson because I was listening to uh, 93.7 A Fan out of Pittsburgh today yeah. uh, when I was working out. And I forget exactly who they had on, but they were talking about that exact same thing, making <laughs> mistakes in uh, one of the – one of the uh, guys said, you know, how about Rob Woodson? He left. And they said, listen, Rob Woodson was at a point in his career where he could only play safety. He couldn't cover his yeah. anymore. And yeah. there's nowhere to put him because you had two really good safeties. And you weren't going to displace either one of those safeties with Rob Woodson. I guess, yeah. And, and you know, that was probably a pretty safe move. The, the, the one guy who stands out to me, if you want to talk about guys leaving who really made a significant mistake was Chad Brown. Yeah, Brown went to Seattle. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was still good. It is significant mistake. Uh, they yeah. offered him a sizable contract. He was a young guy. His wife didn't like the fact that there was no culture in Pittsburgh. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sorry. Uh, I remember his rookie year. I just remember reading this, and it's always stuck with me. He made more money as a snake breeder than he did as a, an NFL player. He bred snakes. He went to he went to Colorado, I think. Colorado. Yes, he did. Yep. He's a Colorado. And, uh, he bred snakes. So he made more breeding snakes than his rookie contract, which 
I, I just always found an interesting nugget about Chad Brown. There was a long time there where we had this solid pipeline in Colorado. We were just bringing in guys. Oh, yeah. Charles Johnson, Cordell Stewart, yeah. Chad Brown. I mean, Dion figures. figures yeah, seven figures. figures. Yep. Uh, Cordell. Oh. Well, yeah. So you're a, you're a pit football fan. Um, what's yeah. your expectations for them? Because you talk about the Steelers having a defense. Their defense is going to be pretty fired up too this year. I hope so. You know, and is, is it Pickett? Kenny Pickett? What's the quarterback? Is it Pickett? Yeah. Um, Pickett. You yeah. know, and then they just got some freshman transfer that came in from somewhere. He came in from Arizona State. Arizona, yeah, ASU. That's it. Yeah, he looked pretty good. But, you know, I'll watch the pit games. Uh, you know, the, it's funny because DirecTV doesn't have the ACC network. But most, I, almost every college football game is somewhere on, you can watch it. So I'll watch a lot of pit games, but you know to always bet the over with them because uh, <laughs> um, if you're telling me the defense has improved, I haven't checked it out that much. I hope so. They're, they're going to be pretty spectacular. Okay, good. No, look, I, look, Pitt, I mean, I grew up with uh, Rick Tricano and Dan Marino. And then yeah, sure. John, John Congemi. And uh, John, I always loved John Congemi. I loved his name because he was Italian, too. Uh, but, I mean, the court, Pete Gonzalez. I mean, they've always uh, – uh, Van Pelt. They always had guys that could sling it, you know. Yeah. And, of course, the history of running backs, too. So, yeah, no, I'm a Pitt fan. I hope so. And uh, I think DK Sports, which, again, is my go-to for, for coverage. I, I'll check the Trib Review, too. I don't do the Post-Gazette as much as I used to because you have to pay for it, and I just don't want to pay for it. I do pay for DK, but it's a reasonable I, – I think I'm a fanatic. I paid one flat rate. But, I mean, you're talking about coverage every day on every team and multiple yeah, and all those updates. I mean, it's, it's such a good website. I, I'm, I'm such a fan of it. It's like my, when I wake up. Or before I go to bed, actually, because I'm, it's, you know, at midnight and late at night when they're posting a lot of their, their follow-ups to games, I'll notice I'll be the first one to comment sometimes because everyone in Pittsburgh's in bed and it's nine o'clock and I'm here reading all the stuff they just posted. So, yeah. um, and I know they went back, they're, 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 you know, he stopped following or covering pit football, but they're, they're going back this season, I believe, or they did pit basketball, but they're doing pit football. Chris Carter, who was covering yeah. the Steelers in the NFL is going to be uh, my guest next week, and oh, okay. he's the one who got assigned to do it. That's it. Okay, I know. And, and DK keeps talking about this, this new app that, that's going to blow everyone's mind, and we keep waiting for it. I think he said by the end of August. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'll watch pitch football, uh, especially now that they've gone back to the colors that we all grew up and loved. Um, I don't care about Penn State. Um, I'll look at WVU scores just because, you know, whatever. It was always – what's that again? To the backyard brawl. That's always been – Backyard a, brawl. Come on. That's the best. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, I, I, I'm still a homer. I mean, you know, I, I, you know what? I, I knew I was doing this podcast with you today, and it's not like I set any of this stuff up. It was like this is the way it is. <laughs> um, but, uh, you, know, it, you know, look, as a comedian, you know, and I – you know, the last time I really worked full time was March. You know, I was in Des Moines, Iowa at the Funny Bone and then came back and I was doing audience warm up for America's Got Talent and then we got shut down. Um, I've done a few things online. Uh, you know, I helped produce a couple game shows from home. Uh, this show Kevin Hart has on, uh, on E! called Celebrity Game Face. So I helped produce that from home and tomorrow I'm doing, I'm actually going to a warehouse in Van Nuys and I had to watch, right before you, I had to watch an hour, I had to take an hour uh, Zoom meeting on COVID training. Very boring, but I'm going to host this uh, run through for a new game show for NBC. And then, uh, you know, I'm flying to Georgia in September to, to I, I have a role on Creep Show, uh, which George Romero created in Pittsburgh. So yep. I'm excited. So, you know, the work for me is, is few and far in between. You know, I mean, the stand up's gone and the audience warm up's gone. So, it's been a rough, it's been a rough quarantine, but you know, sports kind of give me that, that ray of hope sometimes and something to look for, even the pirates. So when we talked about doing the podcast a month ago and we both agreed, Hey, let's let, I'm like, let's wait till, you know, right when the pirates come, I'm ready. But you know, cause I, you know, I watched like PTI and all the shows and listen to podcast. And when, when there was nothing to talk about, boy, it was tough to fill time for, you know, yourself and other guys. And now that they're back, I mean, it, it just gives me something to look forward to because there were, some dark days where I'd get up at noon and just be like, what, you know, I got nothing to do today. Take the dog to the park twice and then 
binge watch Ozark. So, you know, I'm glad I got something that I can watch and gamble on a little bit. Um, so, yeah, sports are important, man. And, you know, my wife said I might be the only guy in America that started a podcast when there were no sports. <laughs> oh, you just started one? Uh, I, I didn't know the guys when you started. I uh, you know what? You're probably one of the fewer, but I bet you there were others because people at least wanted to talk about what could be coming up, you know? Well, the so, thing was, it was on my back. It was, it was something I always wanted to do. But yeah. I always, it was coaching. I was raising my kids. And my yeah. wife said, now you've got time where you can – Put all your stuff together. That I accumulated stuff for two years to put it together. She yeah. said, "Take it, take advantage of the time." I know, and you did. So good for you. Yeah, and it's and it's a good show. I listened to you know. Well, Sean hooked me up with you, and I listened. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just any like you know. This this is I've planned my day around. Well, I had my COVID. I had my COVID Zoom from eleven to twelve, and then you at one, and then uh, at two thirty, my girlfriend and I are going out to do a few things before she's a, a physical trainer and a yoga instructor so she has a class at three or three thirty that she does in the living room which has become the zoom room so we both have professions that are non-existent right now so that also explains why i haven't had a haircut since <laughs> march look at that i look like don robinson or something yeah, you do. My, my hair sticking out or rod scurry or something can you That's throw a rod scurry yes they need a bullpen What's that? I said, if you could throw about 90 miles an hour, they... Hey, I'll tell you what, and Don Robinson could probably still hit the shit out of the ball, too, because he and Rick Roden were the two best hitting pitchers I ever saw. And Rick Rushel, the Pirates actually had three pitchers, like, hit, like, 230. Like, that's unbelievable, you know? And, like, they all had pop. I remember I saw Robinson in a doubleheader. Oh, my God, it was a rain-delayed doubleheader in, like, 80-81. Pirates were just starting to get really old. And in game one, he pitched and got the win, and then game two, he hit a home run. I mean, it was like... You know, those days, those days are, were great. Stephen and, Brault, man, he can hit. Brault can hit and he can sing, which I'm tired of hearing about. Just concentrate on your pitching and sing and play guitar after you're done. But, you know, he's pitching in two hours. And, you know, boy, he's been hot or cold. He'll pitch three scoreless on 30 pitches or he'll get shelled. So, you know, I root for that guy. He's a likable guy. I, you know, yeah. we need a lefty and I don't know. I'm just – uh, him, right? The Pirates always wanted him. And the Orioles drafted him, and then the Pirates traded. I forget what one of those guys that was doing decent for them in the outfield. They traded him away and got Brault, who was a single A guy. Was it Travis top. Snyder? Was it? Did we or we got Travis Snyder from Baltimore? I can't it was remember. Travis Snyder that we traded? Was it? I can't believe up for some reason that was that's really good. That yep. was a good pull right there. Yeah, excellent pull, actually. That and was, I had heard I I had heard his name that the Marlins were looking at Travis Snyder in passing one day. I, I heard the name Travis Snyder. I went what? And it was when the Marlins were coming back. And, of course, they have Cervelli. They have Harold Ramirez, who was a minor leaguer we let go. Uh, so uh, I swear, Travis, maybe that's why his name was in my head. But, but uh, yeah, Brian, Chad Cool, and Chad Cool's been – Chad Cool's look good. We were talking about a guy coming back from Tommy John, and he's got nasty stuff. So, you know, there's some guys that, that you know, that as a homer, uh, I'll grasp at the straws and hope that they develop. We'll just keep our fingers crossed that someday he saw, uh, nutting sells them or something happens, he bumps his head and decides to spend money. I swear. I, and like I said, I have a, a friend who's pretty high up out here, and, and uh, he's actually had dinner with nutting amongst people. And he just says, at the valet, he was – at the valet, they were saying goodbye. And he just said, like, no, I'm never – the team's going to my daughters or his daughters and sons. And just gave the valet like probably a dollar, if that or whatever. <laughs> Got his car and drove away, if, even if he tipped. But he remembers that was a lasting moment, was how curt he was about it. And just like, no, never saw him. I mean, the team's staying in my family. My, they're going to run the team. And got in his car and drove off. And he's never forgot that, 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 that image of literally him getting in a car and driving off like, you know, the pirate's hope. And, you know, we, you know the, everyone will go, oh, well, you know, Huntington, and they, they, you know, they're three straight playoff appearances. That's just, I think, law of averages. Every crappy team is eventually going to have enough. After 20 play. years. I, I mean, you know, of losing baseball. I mean, Seattle, I think, is the longest suffering team without a playoff appearance, I think. But they're not a baseball town. You know, they don't have any world championships or history that's over 120 years old like us. So it's, uh, it's just, it, it's, it, you, you want someone who's an actual fan of baseball and of sports to own a team. And, you know, you get a newspaper guy. And by the way, McClatchy, who came from a newspaper family, 
was a great fan and supporter. And, you know, he helped get the stadium built and he shelled out money at times, gave Kendall a, a contract he should have never had, but, you know, <laughs> but, you know, he did it. I mean, he knew that was, oh, that's what other guys are doing. Whereas Nutting just looks and goes, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play my own game here. Kendall was kind of the McCutcheon of, Kendall was in some ways, he was the McCutcheon of what we just, you know, this era. Yeah, sure. So he, he got the value of having that player still in his, in his clubhouse. And McC but, you know, Kendall, you know, he kind of lobbied to get the, the managing game here in Pittsburgh. When he left Pittsburgh, I don't think he had a lot of kind stuff to say. He wasn't, he wasn't known as the nicest guy, Kendall. He was kind of a salty guy. I've heard some stories. You know, he, he's from Huntington Beach, I think, or San Diego. He's from out here because his dad, Fred Kendall, was a catcher right. and played for the Padres. Yeah. So he grew up out here, I think Manhattan Beach even, when I, I've gone to, and uh, there's a comedy club down there I play. But he, uh, he, never, he was never wild, you know. You don't see him in a lot of the pirate reunion stuff. Not that there'd be any re reason to re reunite those teams. But all of a sudden, he was like, well, you know, I'll manage the Pirates. And I was like, what? It's like, I think you left here on pretty shitty terms, and now – you, with no manage experience, you want to come back? Yeah. Uh, maybe he would have done better. I don't know. Maybe he could. I don't know. All right. My last question for you. Yes, sir. If you were not a comedian, if you didn't work in the entertainment industry. It's an easy question. What would you have done? Baseball broadcaster. That's what I wanted to do. Like I said, I grew up listening to Vince Scully on a transistor radio here. Um, I actually, a couple times in Pittsburgh, I would go to pirate games and sit upstairs with an old tape recorder where you had to hold, play and record down at the same time, which if any millennials are watching, just Google that. Um, and I would record myself doing play-by-play. -play. I remember they had a contest to send tapes in for kids, and I sent a tape in. Uh, total baseball fan, sports junkie, stat junkie. Um, yeah, I mean, I would have, you know, much like comedy, you got to start off in small towns and work your way up to the big city. So. It's something I would have done, and particularly baseball, uh, even like a news anchor at sports yep. I could have done. That would have been something I really like to do. Maybe it's a second career since comedy might never come back. I might have to uh, – is, is the Fetco zone still going? Maybe I can take over for him. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. You could bring it back. <laughs> Chili Boo. Uh, Chili yeah. Boo. Uh, you could bring that thing back. The, 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 the horror show. Yeah. Like Pompey Annie, like I, I, I was always a big fan of those guys in Staggerwall growing up. I remember – all the old sports guys. Um, so yeah, baseball, baseball play by play. And you know, I was lucky enough. I have a hat up here. Hold on. Oh, oh, by the way, this football, I hate showing it. It's either, it might be that one. It's signed it's by, by Charles. OJ? What's that? Is that signed by OJ? No, 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 no. <laughs> this one, that was a Louis Lips. I think this is Louis Lips. 83, that's gotta be Louis Lips. I can't even read it. Um, three, that's lips. That's lips. I, I, I immediately go. The one up there was Terrell Suggs. Uh, when Terrell, but I hate Terrell Suggs. I mean, I don't, you know, he was a rookie. No, he was uh, in college at Arizona State. And when yeah. I was doing street, the game show Street Smarts, we interviewed him when he was still in college. Even knowing he was a number one prospect, I remember someone coming up going, hey, that's T. Sizzle. And I'm like, oh, that's Terrell. I knew of him from Arizona State. And then we brought him into the studio to play for, money like our, our favorite people that we interviewed in the field we brought in the studio and he came in and i had him sign a football and it was two weeks before the draft okay he, he got drafted by pittsburgh and then he got drafted by baltimore but i have this cubs hat right here i don't it's very dusty you can tell look at the inch of dust on this but one of the highlights of my baseball life right here seventh inning stretch 2002 so when i was hosting the game show street smarts it was owned by tribune who owned the cubs and late in the season we were filming in chicago and i got to sing take me out to the ball game during the seventh inning, which is usually like Bill Murray and, you know, these huge celebrities. The day before I was there, it was like Bernie Mac. And then I got to do it. It was late in the season. And I got to do it, so I got this hat. So part of the deal is you get to go over and do a half inning of uh, sit in with the radio team. It was Joe Carter, I think. And uh, so, you know, they were asking me questions about the show, and I was asking about Kevin Ory, who was a, a Pittsburgh ball player, and the Cubs yep. had him. I'm like, where's Kevin Ory? They're like, oh, they knew I knew my stuff, you know. And they're like, all right, we'll take over play by play here. Uh, we're going to let you, since that's your dream, there's one out and a man on first. Next pitch, 6 4 3 double play. And the end of your baseball career. So it was like, it was like this was my shot to do play by play. And one pitch, it was a 6 4 3 double play. And they're like, it's over, you know, whatever. It was just like so heartbreaking. But um, 
but yeah, that would that that would be my answer there. It's baseball's the baseball and sports and broadcasting for sure. Okay. So I do this one final segment on my show, and I love getting my guests involved in it. It's called Decade Definers. I want you to give me your Mount Rushmore of Pittsburgh sports. No. It can be anything. It could be it could be Tim Manoa from when you were in high school. Your right. Mount Rushmore. This All right. Is well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start controversial. Like I'm not gonna put Clemente on there, and I'm only saying that because I didn't see him play. So if you want the people that I saw play. Fair and enough. I would put on my personal one, and I know Clemente would be on every Pittsburghers, and I think a lot would put him on there because they they think they have to. Um, I mean, uh, Willie Stargell for me was my first baseball player, my first poster, my first card. I had the Sports Illustrated cover with him and Bradshaw, so I, I'd have to go. I'd have to put Willie Stargell up there. Um, God, Bonds is such a jerk. I mean, again, not being a huge hockey fan. But understanding and getting to see Lemieux score four goals in a game when I was in Pittsburgh one time, you got to go. I go Stargell, Lemieux, and football-wise, you know, again, the best player I've seen, uh, and again, I've seen his entire career, and I've always been a Roethlisberger fan. So I'll go Roethlisberger. And then, okay, so I got a Penguin, a Pirate, a Steeler. And since I said my other favorite sport was pit football, I'd maybe throw Marino up there because I even even when he was with the Dolphins, he was my favorite non-football player in history. My other non-favorite Steeler in history was Earl Campbell, who played because that guy was just this guy played. You know he can't walk. He's like you know both he can't walk. He's in a wheelchair when he he was just at the uh, College Football Hall. There was something he was just at uh, the national championship game. I think he was on stage. He, he can't walk. Because this guy played for only like seven years, but ran harder than anyone I ever saw. And we all know the, the clips of him running into Donnie Shell. He was, yes. he was, even though I hated the Oilers, I remember watching him play at Texas and that guy was the best. But, um, so I guess I'm going with Stargell, Ben, Lemieux, and Marino. I did see Bradshaw play a lot of games. Maybe I could flip him with Marino. But I did see Marino play all his college years and all his pro years. So maybe I'll stick with those four. That's a good, that's a good Mount Rushmore, Pittsburgh. It yeah. really is. Hey, thanks so much for being on. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad we finally awesome. connected. It was really, it really was. Stay cool out there. Thank you. I'm going to try. I'm drinking two of these. You're supposed to drink half your, your weight in ounces of water. So I got another one and a half of these, but uh, no, I appreciate you having on me. I'm, I'm glad we got to finally make it work. And then, Hey, maybe towards the end of the year, we do it again. Huh? Absolutely. I have no problem with that. And if you ever get into Frederick, please hit me up and yeah, exactly. and, uh, uh, have a beverage. Exactly. There you go. We'll leave it at that. I appreciate it, buddy. Go, go Pirates, go Steelers. Thanks, Frank. Take care. Bye.